Welcome to episode nine of Decently Indecent. Today, it's just me talking about the time I'm almost positive I got cheated on, but didn't really know it at the time. It was not the healthiest of relationships, I will admit. It feels like an eternity ago now, but life has this way of being a ruthless teacher. And a wonderful silver lining of the lessons we learn through those teachings is that it helps inform how we move forward and creates context and boundaries around what we allow into our lives. Now, I don't remember all of what I said. I had a little whiskey in me at the time, but maybe there's an insight or two you may find valuable. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe if you're not gay and also if you are. Welcome back to Decently Indecent, episode nine. And guess what? It's just me and you, pal, okay? No guest here to distract us from the sweet chemistry that is this mic and your eardrums. <laughs> Listen, I've really been enjoying the first two months uh, of the show you know, maybe it's the old head in me, but something about having long conversations with good people really gets my loins moist. However, today it's going to be just me talking alone, which is the first time I've ever done this in a setting that wasn't, you know, making an entertainment focused YouTube video with multiple takes and some pre-written jokes, etc. So it's a chance for you to get to know the guy behind the YouTube videos a bit better, if that interests you. Uh, terrifies me, if I'm being completely honest. Um, but it's also a chance for me to listen to myself talk uh, and touch myself in the process. It is a podcast, after all. Actually, you know what? No, there is cameras rolling. Um, so I guess I'll ta I guess I'll I'll wait until after to do that, which will be behind a paywall, certainly. But um, I first wanted to chat about the purpose of this show and eventually dive into a story about when I was just a young lad and in a toxic relationship that ended in infidelity unconfirmed. Okay. But in hindsight, it see, it seems rather obvious, but uh, just a little look into the part of the journey that got me here. And, uh, and then I want to parlay that into some relationship talk maybe uh, which is very unlike me, but you know what? Uh, this is where we're at now. I don't know. We're just gonna, I'm going to get a little, a little look behind the curtain. You know, I've, for so many years, I've been so adamant and against being, you know, I, anything other than, in, than what I've been, you know, I know some people, you know, like the opposite of Trisha Paytas. If you think about Trisha Paytas, how she just turns on a camera and dumps her guts, every single personal detail in her life onto the internet and people eat that shit up. I'm not a big fan of that. I think there should be a layer of separation between your personal life and what you put online, um, which is which is how I've lived my life, and I've and I've been very fortunate um, to kind of have that barrier. But I do think sometimes it helps just to just to talk a little bit about things that are are a little less skin deep, right? You know, I th in most of the content I've made on YouTube and in, in my career, it's all been pretty surface level just stuff that I, I'm making with a with a focus on on entertainment to make people laugh or occasionally I'll, I'll I'll drop in little tidbits that come from my life experience that I think sometimes people appreciate but uh but yeah this is a little different for me to just sit and talk in a capacity that is not you know focused on nailing the take it's like hey man this is just me with a glass of whiskey um 38 going on 39 in a couple of weeks and and man life's been quite a wild ride and if there's any sort of value that you guys listening can get out of me talking a little bit about what that ride has been like, I think that's pretty cool. So, you know, in in creating this this the title for this show, decently and decent, when I when that came into my head, it it just made sense to me because the idea of having longer conversations with people and just trying to draw people out, get to know their journeys, get to know them a little bit better. Um, it all comes back to, to me really just wanting to live the best life possible while simultaneously feeling completely unequipped to do so. <laughs> and and I, I'll try and expand on what that means a little bit, but I think that, I think that everybody has, you know, their own set of insecurities and inadequacies and, and, and demons, quote unquote, that they, that they deal with. And, you know, I'm no exception to that, to that rule. Um, but I've always been very determined to figure out how to traverse those things, those insecurities and, and those demons and, and try and live the, the best life possible in spite of that. And I think that 
can happen a lot of different ways. And for me, it was just at a point in my life where I wanted to to get to know people better on a more personal level in a capacity that wasn't, you know, reacting to shit that was inflammatory. Like, obviously, you guys know on my my channel, I've had guests on over the years where we do videos where we're reacting to stuff in the typical Leon Lush fashion. But I reached a point in my life where I was, this type of thing really speaks to me. And so regardless of what, you know, the, the analytics say or the views say, I know there's going to be a portion of my audience, even if it's a small portion, that appreciates this kind of thing. So I'm going to keep doing it. I don't know where it's going to go, what it's going to go into. I've thought a lot recently about uh, looking for some sort of co-host that I could work with uh, in a manner that heightens the experience for everybody watching. And obviously that adds a different dynamic when you have guests on, you have someone to play off of. It's a whole different uh, dynamic. I haven't totally decided on that yet, um, but I'm willing to I'm willing to experiment and just take feedback and continue iterating um, which is the only thing that's ever gotten me anywhere, which is just consistency over time, doing something uh, in a capacity where you suck at it for a while. And eventually, if you do it long enough, you get decent at it. And who knows, you might find an audience along the way. So, so that's my plan. Now, I don't consider myself wise by any means. You know, I, I, I struggle a lot with imposter syndrome and insecurity when it comes to giving advice or suggesting how people might live their life. So anytime I'm talking about something in a more serious tone, I get insecure about trying to, you know, share my experience because I feel like it might come off as preachy or like, hey, like this is, this worked for me, so maybe it could work for you. Some of you know on my, on the main channel, I released a video at the end of 2023 called 20 Principles that enhanced my life. I don't remember the exact title. It was like 20 principles that uh, changed my life dramatically over 2023. And that was my first soiree really into trying to not be preachy, but be like, hey, here's some things that I've that I've learned and that I've adopted that have really benefited my life. And maybe you can you guys can find some value in that. And I got a lot of really good feedback on that video. And it's like in typical YouTube fashion, it was so unlike what I normally do. St analytically, the video did terribly. But at the same time, I think the impact that that video had on the portion of my audience that watched it and enjoyed it was, you know, 10x what a normal video would be just as far as, you know, oh, this is funny and entertaining. But so stuff like that, it makes me think a lot because when you when you do this, when you do this, you know, when you're in this <laughs> this game for long enough, it's so easy to get caught up in dashboards and analytics and, and, you know, the ups and downs of the feedback you get via the algorithms and YouTube and stuff. And it's really easy to forget sometimes that something doesn't have to be algorithmically friendly to be impactful for somebody watching or listening. And I try to remind myself of that a lot. Like I said previously, you know, I wrestle with a, a litany of my own demons, quote unquote, as I'm sure many of you guys listening or watching do. And as soon as I conquer one, another one pops up, you know, pops its head up like a game of demon whack-a-mole or some shit. And I, I'm certain I'm not alone in this. I know everyone has their own, their own things in life that really take a lot of their energy and their focus. So I'm not unique in that sense. And I think that's great because we kind of all share, we all share that in in a way where everyone is in their own unique situation where they have their their own wins and their own losses. And there there's these these particular affectations or proclivities in their life, whether they're degenerate or whatever it is that really kind of shape who they are and who they become. And it's our our ability to to recognize those proclivities and whether they're good for us or bad for us in in that way deal with them accordingly you know indulging you know as i like to right now with this glass of whiskey and something that i enjoy but also indulging in a way that's responsible and and all these things so you know uh, in saying that all i'm really trying to say is you know i i feel like i've been very fortunate in my life in a lot of different ways, in business, in my relationships, uh, my family, 
And so, you know, as much as it's weird for me to to talk on a more serious level without somebody else present, you know, it's very easy for me to parlay off somebody else. That's one of the, I feel like the skills or talents I have is just being a conversationalist. Um, but as much as that's weird for me, if it, you know, if it might be of any insight to, to any of you guys listening, um, I guess that could be a cool thing. So as I said in the beginning, I want to, I just want a little story time real quick, uh, just harking back to, geez, what was it? Late 2000s, you know, I was just a, a young lad just out of college. Um, I had gotten my four-year degree in exercise science from the University of New Hampshire. I had a great experience. I, I spent the summer after I graduated at an internship, or it was a, it was a paid internship, and that paid internship then turned into uh, a job for the summer of 2007, I guess, where I was I was working at a Navy shipyard as a trainer at the gym on base. And I did that for the summer. And this was, you know, because I, I graduated with a kinesiology degree. I didn't really know what direction I wanted to take at the time. But I was also coming out of college and in the midst of a, a, a relationship that was failing. It was with like my senior year fling. I honestly caught, I think I caught feelings and she was more like in the fling mindset. I was so naive. If many of you guys that don't know me when I was younger, I, I was a bit of a late bloomer. You know, I was, I was homeschooled. I was raised, I was raised Christian and conservative. And, you know, I wasn't sheltered by any means. I give my, my parents a lot of credit for that, but I was definitely naive in a lot of ways when it came to relationships with females. So the the crumbling of that relationship kind of fucked me up. I I left that training job and was just like, you know what? I fuck this. I'm going to just I'm just going to make money. I'm just going to like let's focus on me and I ended up just like I was looking into pharmaceutical sales and just some sort of sales job. Like, what's the way I can make the most amount of money as fast as possible, right? <laughs> for whatever reason. I'm just going to completely abandon this fucking degree that I just spent four years getting. I just, I, at the time, I was like, you know what, training, I, I love I love exercise science and biology and the study of the human body. Obviously, to this day, I'm glad I got that degree because it's so interesting to me and how I can apply it in my own life. But I just didn't like the idea of being a trainer for other people being that guy that was the coach or the motivator for whatever reason, just at the time wasn't hitting. So I ended up interviewing at a bunch of places, didn't get into pharmaceutical sales, but I got into to biotech instrument sales. And I spent a year traveling around New England, licking my wounds from my, from my late college relationship and just selling plastics and pipetter tips and PCR machines to different research labs and pharmaceutical companies around New England. And when I tell you, I fucking hated that job. I mean, there was never been, there's been few times in my life where I've had a year that was, that so well informed my future because after that year in sales, I truly it was, I had an introspective moment where I was like, you know what? Some people are, are born to do this type of thing. I know for a fact that this is not my calling. This is not my purpose. And it was at the end of that year, I drove cross country with one of my best friends at the time, with my best friend to this day, still my best friend. We drove cross country to California. He was moving out there at the time. This was in 2008. Stopped in Vegas for two nights, got a little degenerate. Went out to San Diego. I spent two weeks in San Diego as he was settling in. That, to me, was the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, seeing the lifestyle out there, it was it was more laid back. It was beautiful weather. People were moving slower. It was, you know, I grew up in New England, Boston area my whole life. So it was very like, eh, what the fuck, you fucking asshole? And everyone's like, head down, no, you know, the, the unfriendly, focused on work type of, type of mindset. And all of a sudden, I'm out there and I'm like, man, this is like, this is like an oasis. This is crazy. So I called my boss while I was in California. I quit my sales job and I was just like, I'm going to be a musician, I guess. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. So I, so I fucking, oh man, this is wild. Telling my parents that story uh, in hindsight, calling them up, be like, hey guys, I went to college, got a four year degree, and uh, yeah, had a good job, and I just quit it because I want to be a musician. 
God bless them. They they were supportive because the reason I even had that inclination is because I come from a family with uh, a, a concert pianist mother who's been a, an organist and involved in uh, the production of of church music and teaching her whole life. So I had this, I had a proclivity, as I've said a few times already, for music and just wanted to live a different lifestyle that was of a creative nature as opposed to being that guy that was worried about, you know, numbers and sales and I need to find new ways to get new clients and get these people to buy this product that I, blah, blah, blah. And so I, you know, flew home from California, left my best friend out there and I went to Guitar Center, bought a cheap music interface. I bought an acoustic guitar and a mic and an XLR cable. And that was it. That was that was the start of my my YouTube journey. So I spent the the next several years in 08, 09 uploading covers to YouTube as a lot of you listening might know. A lot of those covers uh and songs are still up on my channel if you go back far enough. A lot of them are privated because in viewing them in hindsight is just too painful <laughs> and how cringe it was. But all this is to say, I'm going a little bit down the rabbit hole because I just kind of re reliving those years sometimes. It's an incredible to think that now it was, you know, over 15 years ago, which is unreal to think about. I started uploading YouTube videos that long ago. But um, this was around the time where I, it, I, I met my uh, next future ex-girlfriend <laughs> and she uh you know so and that happened because when i quit my sales job and got the guitar of course i i needed to support myself i was living in the boston area in an apartment with some some college friends um and i knew this girl from high school that worked at the cheesecake factory and heard the money was pretty decent so i texted her i was like yo could get could you get me a could you get me an interview at the Cheesecake Factory? So, you know, I had mild, I had like one or two summers of restaurant experience uh, from the summers I was home from college. Anyways, I get the job at Cheesecake Factory and that was uh, the next almost decade of my life, working at the Cheesecake, learning to play guitar, playing guitar, gigging as a solo musician, as acoustic musician, playing at cafes, bars, um, eventually joining a band, et cetera. But early on in my YouTube, or excuse me, early on in my... In my Cheesecake Factory days, I met a girl there. She had moved from uh, she had moved from upstate New York, and you know I was very unseasoned in the relationship game. Like I had mentioned previously, I was naive in a lot of ways. And at this time, I was I would think I was probably twenty by this point. I had had one girlfriend briefly in high school that fell off after high school, and then you know I went pretty much all of college without a girlfriend until my senior year, which I, I mentioned previously how that went. And so this was like my third, my third, uh, my third, uh, yeah, what do you say? My third, so I wanted to say soiree, but Jesus Christ, man, how many times can you say a word that stupid in one podcast? If I use it again, I'm going to rope myself. This was my third attempt or whatever. It just kind of happened. So we like, we hung out. <clears throat> she was into me for some reason. When I tell you guys, like, honestly, if you're listening right now, if I can paint a picture for you, this was the awkward phase, like the most, this was like a late awkward phase for me. Like when you're post-college, you should be past your awkward phase. No, no, no. I fully dove back into the awkward phase because I came from being like the, the clean cut sales guy into wanting to be the next John Mayer musician dude. So I was like determined to grow my hair long. And at this point, I was in the weird phase of hair growth where it wasn't long and it wasn't short. It was just incredibly like kind of comb over lesbian looking. And I had horn rim glasses and it was, it was looking back. It was just something else. I don't know what this chicks on me at the time or why she was interested in me. It's probably just because I'm 6'3 and large and that kind of like by default <laughs> makes you attractive to some girls. <laughs> well, she's fucked up, but it is just kind of true. And, you know, so we hung out a few times after drinks after work, turned into some dates. And uh, next thing you know, like we're moving in together. We dated for like two years, I want to say, but, um, you know, we moved in together after two and then we're together for another two years. I think we were together for almost four years in total. But, you know, looking back, it's it's interesting because 
when you're in an unhealthy relationship, especially for someone like myself at the time where I didn't have a lot of relationship experience and certainly didn't have really any healthy relationship experience previous to that. It was like kind of flings and me catching feelings of something that was unserious. Uh, but when you're in, when you're in it, it's hard to tell, like you kind of, you, it's easy to get to fall under this spell of, you know, you're, you're in this new life now with this person you're sharing your life with. And you know, you, you kind of know something's off maybe, but it's tough to know, especially if you don't have something to compare it to. But, you know, I came, for me at that time, I came from an incredible family life where I had an, a really, really good example set from my parents of how a loving relationship should be. So, so I was fortunate to have that example set for me because I know a lot of people don't have that so it becomes even harder <clears throat> and oftentimes a lot of times relationships are unhealthy because the people in the relationship have never been modeled what a healthy relationship should look like so that gets even worse so so I'm in this thing and I, I know something's off and you know I don't I don't want to like spit a bunch of vitriol about this particular situation I mean I think she had a lot of really redeeming qualities she just had some issues when she was younger and she, she th those manifested into some behavioral issues and some anger problems that just were exacerbated by alcohol. And this is one of those crazy things in a relationship or just with people in general. But, you know, you might meet the coolest person, the nicest guy, the nicest girl, and then they drink a certain amount and turn into someone totally different. And it's fucked up because you're like, man, like, if they just didn't drink or like is they'd be cool, but it's like, are they just, are they just hiding this part of them that's living in there? And they've figured out how to <clears throat> push it down. And then when they drink or they, the real them comes out or, or me, you know, there's so many different questions and, and alcohol affects so many you know, alcohol affects people in such a unique way. Like it all has the same mechanism of action, but it's so weird how so many people respond very individualistically to it. And I've spoken about this in my my body cam videos I do, where a lot of them, a lot of these people getting banged up and arrested are obviously like fucked up on drugs or, or booze or whatever. And, uh, you know, so, you know, some people can go out and have some drinks and just become the nicest, happiest, happiest people. And, move on to the next thing and other people have, you know, three sips of some brown liquor and they want to fight everybody they see. And so that has to be taken into account when you're getting in a relationship with someone. And that was, that was unfortunately just uh, part of the deal at the time. This, this girl I was dating just had uh, a propensity to just get unhinged when she drank and it. It really, it taught me a lot. You know, this was, this was several years of, getting into conflict and fights. And if you know me and people that people that know me, I am a very patient, docile, gentle giant of a man. I've said this in videos with my wife before, and we joke about how, you know, I, I get competitive and angry at video games and I flip out playing competitive video games uh, sometimes over stupid petty shit. And I know it's petty and useless to get mad at, but I do. But outside of that, in my general life and my real life with relationships and people and just anything very patient very calm i it's very very difficult to get me riled up so <clears throat> having lived my life like that for you know 19 20 20 at this time i was in my early 20s it was scary for me because there were some moments in that relationship where i really saw um a side of myself that i didn't know existed uh this this kind of this unbridled rage that 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 would bubble up didn't happen often but it was the first time in my life where another human was able to it was like they she knew every single perfect button to push and it just brought the absolute worst out of me and you know the worst i ever did i think was you know blow a blow a hole in the drywall with my fist or something. It never got physical on my end. There were, you know, there were times where I was on the receiving end of some 
uh, questionable, <laughs> some questionable things, but uh, that is that is what it is. But man, did, did I fucking hey? In hindsight, learning it, and like I said, when you're in these things, like you don't. It's sometimes tough when you're under the spell to realize just how fucked up these things are. So, eventually, um, things came to a head. I ended up leaving, staying with a friend at the time that I worked with for like three or four days, and it was very difficult. And uh, I don't know what it was, but you know, the, it was like did that whole thing where we tried it again, got back together. This was at the end of it. Started living together again, and. After that, though, it was different. It was a little weird. All this time, too, we were together. Like I was, <laughs> this was the this was the fucked up part. Is like I was the I was the struggling, starving artist, bartend, you know, server by day at the Cheesecake Factory, playing a couple of gigs here and there. Was underwater on my car payments. I couldn't even. I couldn't afford my student loans. In Meanwhile, she was in an, a unique situation where she had a a trust that she, you know, had from her late mother and all these things. She, it, it was a weird dynamic because she had unbelievable trust issues because when she initially lost, when she lost her mother, she was was left with this trust and she, her family essentially tr lawyered up and tried to take her to court to to take her for all she was worth trying to get a piece of the pie right and it created this unbelievable trust because all of her family that she was that was supposed to love her and she was supposed to be able to trust tried to take advantage of her and so that really that really informed how i think she treated relationships anyway so that it, the dynamic was strange because it was like i'm the starving artist guy i never wanted a dime or asked her for anything but she wanted to live this lifestyle that i couldn't live up to because I, I mean, Jesus, I could barely pay my, I could barely pay my rent, you know, my half of the rent. And, uh, so I can remember times getting into these blow up fights over like fucking Keurig coffee. Like, oh, I, uh, she, like she bought the Keurig coffee the last two times and I haven't contributed to the Keurig. <laughs> like the last, and I'm like, I'm like, what if, what are we fucking talking about here? Like, okay. Like just, just ask me to, I'll figure it out. But there was just such a mismatch of priorities. It was, it was unbelievable. And a lot of these things in life are timing too. Like, you know, I don't know. I was just at a tough place in my life to be a reliable partner. I, and that, that is what it was. And that doesn't excuse some of the behavior that went on, but Anyways, it, when it came to the end, it, getting to the the title of this particular podcast, she was in a business. Uh, she was going to school. She'd finished school in some certain areas of design, and uh, it got to this point where there was she had someone she started working with um, on some projects or something. It was this other guy, and she would uh, uh, once in a while have to go over his place to 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 do some work on some of the projects or something. I don't like, it sounds so, <laughs> it sounds like the plot line of a fucking movie in hindsight, dude, I was so oblivious at the time. I had no fucking clue. And I can't even to this day, I have no confirmation. I, because I, you know, we just didn't, after things ended, it was, we went our separate ways and that was that. But eventually it got to a point where one day, I don't know if I wasn't supposed to be home or something. I think she thought I was gone and she ended up like getting dropped off by him in our driveway or something. It just seemed really sketchy. And in that moment, I was like, huh, I'm like, that's weird that like they're in the same car together. Like he picked her up or something. It just seemed like a little more than a normal, like, oh, I went to do some business or something. And I don't even honestly remember, like I, I, this for the second time was the one who, who now broke it off for good. I, I moved out. I found a, I was on, I went on Craigslist and found this, like, I call it, I, I joke about it. I joke about it and call it the halfway house at the time, because it was literally like this five room house where some dude just lived in the basement and just rented out all of the rooms to random people on Craigslist. There was no, there was no down payment. There was no security deposit. It was literally just first month rent, first month's rent, and you could move in. It was amazing because I didn't, you know, I didn't have any money for anything. So I couldn't afford like 
a first month rent plus security plus deposit. No fucking chance. So this place was dope. I moved in. It was like a room that was like eight by eight. I went on to Craigslist again and I found a woman who had a futon mattress because I had nothing. Like most of my shit, I'd been living with her for a while. I didn't have a bed. I didn't have anything. I found a, a futon mattress on Craigslist. I drove to this woman's house in Cambridge. It was this delicate old black woman, nice little old lady. And I went in to pick up the futon mattress. When I tell you this thing was caked in cat hair, like didn't even, didn't even bother cleaning it. It was just layers of cat hair and probably piss and shit all over it. I pick it up. I throw it in the back of my Toyota Camry, 2009, excellent car, <laughs> still running today in my family. I, I don't drive it anymore, but, uh, and I drive back to the halfway house and I, I throw the futon mattress on the ground, give it a quick vacuum. And here's my new, here's my new digs, a eight by eight room in this funny little shack of a house with a fucking futon mattress in the middle of an empty room. And that's when I started to rebuild my life. And, uh, yeah. And, and in hindsight, I was still under the spell, dude. It was so weird. Like the first few months after that were so difficult, but this is going back to this, this uh, infidelity or whatever. So I, I am like good for like a month or like five weeks. And then I start to have those thoughts in your head. Like, Oh, what, what if you made a mistake? Like I was such a fucking, I just, I don't know. It's just, I was so young and naive at the time. And so like, um, I contact her, like we have an exchange. Anyways, all this, all this culminates in, I want to say it was like five weeks after I moved out. I, I think I'm Facebook stalking at the time, as you do with an ex or whatever. And I see that she's on like a two week vacation in the Cayman Islands with this dude who she was quote unquote doing, uh, was working with, doing work projects with or something. And I'm like gutted or whatever. Not because I wanted to get back. I just, it is, I think at that time, it was just this feeling of betrayal, obviously, that it's a normal feeling. And even at that time, I don't even think I, I don't even think I knew. I don't even think I suspected. I'm like, oh, that's so, it's so quick for her to like, that was so fast. I'm like, and, and I'm like, you naive moron, Leon. Like how long were they probably fucking while you guys were still together? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. But it wasn't until years later that I think I really had the hindsight and the wisdom as I aged a little bit to digest it and be okay with it. And I, it really didn't affect me super adversely at the time, but that relationship was such a wonderful blessing in disguise because it, I say this is, you know, silver linings and all that. It really, it, it taught me so many things that I, that were deal breakers for me in a relationship. It taught me all uh, this laundry list uh, of, of things that I couldn't deal with that were deal breakers for me, um, which I think, you know, you got to take the good from the bad sometimes. And relationships are funny because, you know, some people just really have shit luck. And when you're in relationships where you give your all and you give your trust and that trust is broken, whether it's through infidelity or something, that can really fuck you up for a long time. And if it happens enough, it can, I think for some people, uh, it can really just, it can make it difficult for them to find somebody who they are actually compatible with because they are less likely to put themselves in situations and they are less likely to be willing to give themselves to somebody who might be the person for them. So it's very sad and that's there's not really any rhyme or reason to it. It's just the way life goes. But but for me that was that was an interesting year. Um I I did the uh, the classic like I did the classic, you know, you're single again, get your shit together, get in shape, all this stuff. Like I was working out every day. I was running. I was running like five miles. I'm eating canned tuna fish and fucking salsa. Like I'm going hard. Best shape of my life probably at that time. I lost a bunch of weight. Girls at work are swooning. Fucking the hair's now finally long. I'm in a band. I'm fucking jacked. Crazy fucking crazy year. Anyways, a uh, year and a half later, that's when I finally met. Uh, my now wife, Mrs. Lush, as a lot of you guys know, Christina. And <clears throat> when when I met her, I was in no mindset to be in another relationship. I was still pretty jaded. I was it was very like, you know, whatever this is, it's just gonna be fun. 
blah, blah, blah. But I won't get into the crazy details of like how we started dating or started hanging out, but it was through a mutual friend in the restaurant that I worked in. She worked at the Cheesecake Factory too at a different location and some of her friends came to my store. So she came to visit them one day, sat at my bar. We got to know each other, kicked it off, locked eyes a few times. One thing led to another. We go to a Sox game with a group of friends and blah, blah, blah. We're, we're start to hang out. Um, in that next nine months was was wild for me because I came from, you know, uh, four years of of a unhealthy relationship where I learned a lot about what I really couldn't tolerate or didn't like uh, in a partner. But I didn't know that. I didn't know I learned that until I started to get to know Christina better because I had all of this PTSD <laughs> around certain things that were like triggers for my ex and all these things I couldn't do uh, when you're with, all these things you can't do when you're with someone who has horrific trust issues. And all of a sudden, I'm with a functional, normal human being and it was it was so fucking wild to go from one extreme to the other. It was like there was like moments of disbelief where I would be like, <laughs> yeah, you know, like I would be ruminating, like, all right, I want to go out and hang out with um, you know, my buddies tonight after work. Maybe we'll have a couple of drinks. And like, you know, we had just started dating for a little, we'd been dating for a little while. It wasn't super serious yet. We didn't live together or anything. And I'm like, how do I how do I do this? How do I say this to her without getting in a fight? And I never, I wasn't like doing unreasonable things, right? I just had PTSD from this unhealthy relationship. So like me wanting to do normal things made me feel guilty or like I was doing something wrong and I had to like hide it or figure out how to like pull a fast one on her. And so I'd finally be honest and be like, hey, sweetheart, like I just was hoping after work and go out and have like a couple of drinks tonight and like, I was like, yeah, man, have fun. Have a great time. It's cool. See you tomorrow. I was like, what the fuck? I was like, are you tricking me? Is this a, is this a joke? Are you tricking me? So like, <laughs> it, it's so silly, man. Like I'm looking back now, this was over 10 years ago now. You know, we, we've been together for, for over 10 years now, married for, for seven. It's just tough to think about my, my outlook on life and my view on relationships at the time. But I think that is sometimes just how life goes. Like you, you, life is kind of a, a long journey of getting punched in the face and then just learning along the way. And, you know, with, with, with heart, with heartbreak and hardship comes learned experiences that hadn't hopefully turn into wisdom. Um, and I think that was, that was a big part of my, big part of my process, a big part of the, the learning experience in my life. Um, and I don't know, you know, maybe I lucked out. I think I look back all those years and just all of those initial, that initial year where I was like all of these realizations where all of the PTSD I had and all these things that really like fucked me up from the previous relationship. I was like, oh, those aren't normal. And now, <clears throat> now this is what it's like. This is, this is normal. This is what it, this is what a relationship should feel like. There's trust, there's honesty, there is companionship this desire for your partner to have their own life and to have their own friends and you have independent lives as much as you know you have this life together and all these different things so <clears throat> you know credit to her and this is not to say like we both don't have our shortcomings like we we certainly like every everybody knows that in every relationship there's always things that people excel at and and things that they're not good at but I think there's just like this random part of the equation where sometimes two people just have a weird compa uh, compatibility that works out. And, and that's not to say that relationships don't take work because they obviously do. There's a lot of, you know, pillars in relationships that, that take work and that need to be there. Obviously like trust and honesty for me is, is the biggest one. Um, I know that's for a lot of people, just from what I what I see in the comment section on on Lush Life when, when my wife and I do videos about relationship stuff and the current the current landscape of the dating scene and the new generation uh of of dating 
seems awful. It just seems tough. I mean, with the proliferation of dating apps and the ephemeral world we live in and everything kind of feeling expendable now, like, oh, if this, the first sign of, the first sign of struggle, it's you can just abandon ship and swipe right or swipe left and find a new person. Like it feels, it feels difficult. And I, I don't have a lot of insight into that because I think that is just a consequence of, of the digital age and social media and, and living our lives online. Um, so I feel very fortunate in that way to have, to have met my wife, you know, a decade plus ago before things really took off. Although I will say at the time when we started dating, she was on match.com, which she's admitted she had gone on a date or two on there. Cause she was whatever messing around with it. Um, and then, and then she met me and that was the end of that. But, uh, but yeah, just the, the trust and honesty that I don't think you can have a, a relationship that lasts if that's not there, you know, just, and that comes, that has to be from, from both sides. And unfortunately some people have been burned so many times that it's really difficult for them to do that. But I just, I don't think you can have a relationship really flourish without just an unyielding trust, open, you know, open phone, like whatever, like you, you want to, Oh, you need to look something up on my phone. Here you go. Take my phone. Whatever. I got, there's nothing to hide. There's not, we're just, we're on the same team. We're going to bat for each other. That's it. There's communication, support, obviously compromise, all these things. I could go, I could go for days, but at the end, ultimately it comes down to just this weird, uh, I think sometimes random luck of the draw where you meet somebody that has personality traits that complement your personality traits there's obviously going to be some friction, but it doesn't outshine uh, the the synergy and harmony that you share uh, as a team working together to share a life. So I feel unbelievably lucky to be in a position where I've I've found that um, with my wife. I want to, so so respect is another one though. Like you know, I just I from what I see online with like this new age of. Uh, you know, like young men that are just directionless, looking for direction, you know, they, they, they gravitate towards like these Andrew Tate guys and these other guys with the, with the suits and the Rolexes and the cars and the entrepreneurs and all these things. And there's a lot of qualities that those guys have that are prob that are admirable, you know, like I think as a man, I think you want to, you want to adopt masculine qualities and be somebody that your wife respects and that in, 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 in values uh, and there's a lot to be said about that, but, but at the same time, it, it goes both ways. Like as a man, you also can't just, you know, find a girl and then hang up the hat and expect, you know, oh, you don't have to, you don't have to do anything to make her, you know, to, to woo her or wow her, or make you want to stay, you know, to, to keep, to make her want to stay in love with you. Like it, it's, I just think a lot of guys just kind of hang it up after that initial honeymoon phase or after the after the the marriage certificate or the kid comes whatever but nah man these things take persistent effort over, persistent effort over time um what so uh, the respect thing is another one too this is a huge one for me um you learn to try and respect things that matter <laughs> to your to your partner like i i have an example a little story for this one and anyone who watches the Lush Life channel where I do videos with my wife knows um, about her phobia of mice or rats or critters. Basically anything that's a critter or a rodent, uh, it's whatever. Like if it's not in the, if it's outside bugs, whatever, they're just annoying. But if there's something in her house, she hates it. And if it's a mouse or a, like a chipmunk, <clears throat> it's definitely borderline what I would consider phobia. Like certainly if you have a mouse problem in your house, you're going to try to take care of it. But most people, it's like, oh, that's fucking annoying or it's creepy. Yeah, it is what it is. But so we live in the the suburbs and in a wooded area. And we have a, a wall in our house that we've, uh, there's some fucking entry point and mice just find a way to get in. Like, and so occasional, like occasionally we'll be watching TV or something and you can hear them kind of like scratching in the walls. And then we go down the basement where a couple finish rooms are, and there's like a a, cl a closet under the stairs where the 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 uh, the service panel is to the house, the electricity, and um, you know you'll see the droppings and stuff. So 
it it's for it's just been a battle for me. It's like me versus the mice, like trying to get these things under control. And they're not like overwhelming. They're not like running through the house. They're just occasionally, they just typically stay in the walls and then leave. Occasionally, one time I saw one in the basement room briefly, but once I started setting traps, that's when you know because all of a sudden you're catching all of them. So I'm setting traps. I'm trying to deal with it. It just never ends. It's like I catch three and five more show up. I kill five, seven more show up. It just never ends. But all the while I'm doing this is like because she it's ruining, it's ruining her life. Like this idea that there is possibly a mouse in her house or in a wall. It's like keeping her up at night. She's having in 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 her defense, I don't want to say in her defense, and I like she doesn't love talking about it because I, you know. For, for obvious reasons, but also because maybe there's a little embarrassment around how much it bothers her. I think with, with phobias, maybe that's <clears throat> that's normal. But it took me like a while because I'm the type of guy who I I could sit in a room and just like give a little mouse a piece of cheese and like pet him on the head. I wouldn't fucking care. Wouldn't bother me at all. Like if they're in my house, I'm going to try to exterminate you and get you out of there because I don't want you in my house. But like I have zero zero worry around shit like that it doesn't bother me if i'm down there gaming and a mouse nibbles at my toe i just ah you motherfucker get out of here right so totally opposite of how she is and so i've had to learn you know there'd be times where like i'm in the middle of a project or working or i'm doing something important and i'm just getting a call like hey you need to come to the house like i hear it in the wall you got to do something like all these things and <clears throat> it just got to a point where it was like I had been, I'm like, I'm doing everything I can. I've called two exterminators. I'm setting the traps and doing everything. Like, I don't know what else you want me to do. And there was a brief period of time where it became contentious, where it was like, all right, I can't take any more of this, right? Like I have fucking, I have done everything I can. I had a moment, I had a moment, but then I, I, I got it together and I was like, you know what? <laughs> this is part of what being in a relationship is even Sometimes when something is irrational to you, if it matters to your partner a great deal, it needs to matter to you too. I don't know. It's been, that has served me so well in, in, in the last 10 years. And listen, I, have, I fall short in so many areas that I could be better at, that I could talk about for days. But respect your partner enough to try your best to care about the things that matter to them. Um, especially something like that, that is like on the level of phobia and find a way to make compromises and find a way to not, even if it is, if, even if it is bothering you, at least try and feed an interest in it. Not necessarily if it's something you're interested, that they're interested in like a hobby, but if it's something that really matters to them, like it should matter to you too. So I'm certainly not a relationship guru and I, you know, I, I feel, I always feel so strange even talking about it, because I, I don't ever want to, uh, every relationship is very unique in the sense that there's a lot of underlying pillars that probably people share, but different people have different languages of love and different ways they feel appreciated and stuff like that. So it is, you know, what it's not a one size fits all type of thing. Um, communication, obviously, like a meme, like that's that's an obvious one. Silence builds resentment and resentment is like an acid that corrodes the foundation of everything beautiful and good simply talking about things that need to be talked about because oftentimes there's just misunderstandings <clears throat> and when misunderstandings don't get talked about that's how resentment builds right but i don't know man i get like i see a lot of comments and stuff on the on the lust life channel from people um relationships are are one of those interesting things in life where they permeate every part of our world and our culture and society, whether you're in one or whether you're not in one, you're thinking about it or you're for it or you're against it. It's just, it is what it is. It's one of the, the bedrocks of, uh, you know, human existence. So I don't have an answer for anybody that's, you know, maybe listening to this and, and feeling a little bit lonely or, or hoping that they can find someone that they can share their life is their life with, excuse me. Um, I think the only thing I would say is that, you know, if you've been burned before, I think maybe a few times, I don't, it's probably going to be really difficult to be able to open yourself up to someone again. But I think that is the only way to truly 
build a relationship that will stand the test of time is to be able to fully trust somebody, even if you've been burned before. And that was my experience with <clears throat> having been burned. And I think at the time I was so naive that probably my naivete helped because it, if I truly knew what went on at the time, I might've been more hesitant in opening up again. And it did take me a little while. Like I said, at the time when I met <clears throat> Christina, I was not in relationship mode. I was just like, no way. This is going to be fun. We're going to be hanging out. And just the more I got to know her, the more I was like, man, okay. All right. You know what? This, wow. This is the polar opposite of what I experienced before. Let's give this a shot. And then, you know, here we are 10 years later and I'm like, fuck man, I got lucky. So there is an, unfor I think an, un an unfortunate, an unfortunate truth to the, also to the idea that there is just luck and timing. And I mean, there's a lot of people in this world and sometimes some people have to go through one bad one to meet the one that they're compatible with. And maybe some people go through their whole life and never find them. <clears throat> I don't know. That sounds rather bleak, but I like to think that for, for, for everybody listening, that there is a version of a person out there that will appreciate you for you and you will find that person. And I hope that's the case. And I appreciate you guys listening to this little story time. I mean, this is so, it's been interesting, fun for me to just walk down memory lane a little bit, relive some of those years. Um, you know, I'm coming up on 40 in just over a year. And what a journey it's been. You know, I, I talk so much about YouTube and stuff on, the, on on this podcast, and I just wanted to to dive a little bit into what life was like for me before all that stuff, I mean, it's been just a, a series of <laughs> wild journeys that have led me here. And I think that um, I probably have quite a few more wild journeys in front of me. But I will say, like, I feel so blessed because when you have a a solid foundation or like, you know, I know for some people, like, they're, it, for people that are in a unhealthy or toxic relationship, that takes up so much fucking energy it takes up all of your energy to be in that situation and it leaves no energy or thought or time to do anything that could possibly benefit you or, or your life so it's such it, it is an incredible feeling to to be in a place where i can where that side of my life the home life and the family feels so wonderful and i'm so blessed that i can put my my energy and my mind and my efforts elsewhere to other things, um, to grow the business or to do whatever, to just spend time with my son, be with the family and enjoy myself. So I appreciate you guys listening. Um, it's a little bit of a insight into what my life was like before YouTube. And, uh, you know, we'll be back soon with some more guests. I'm looking forward to having more conversations and seeing what happens over the next couple of months and years. Cause I, uh, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying this style of content and I know it's not going to be as algorithmically friendly, but I know there's a few of you guys out there that might enjoy it too, so I appreciate you. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Deuces.